Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, excited to have you guys here. Thanks for jumping on and joining me this morning. I got a couple of things that I want to go through with you uh, today. So um, where I thought I would start with today and um, what I thought I would share with you guys to begin with, we're going to talk um, a little bit about seller disclosures. But first, before we do that, I've got one other thing that I want to show you here. Oop, I've got some background noise going with somebody there. Looks like they muted it. So we're good. Okay. So uh, what I want to just show you guys first is this is uh, what you're looking at is a bill that uh, was passed up at our last legislative session. And I just want to make sure everyone is aware of this. And so this was uh, Senate Bill 240 is what it was. And the idea behind it, I, some of you probably have heard about it. Um, some may not have heard about it yet, but um, just wanted to make sure you're aware of it. So in this bill, what they passed is to help first time home buyers to purchase homes, but specifically new construction properties. So in this bill, what is happening is that the property has to be a newly constructed or newly constructed but not yet inhabited home. So it has to be either brand new construction or it was built and, and nobody's lived in it yet. They have to get a mortgage for it, has to be owner occupied and has to be less than or equal to $450,000. And if they do that, the buyer, and this, this uh, by the way, this all goes into effect starting in July is when this will go into effect, but it will allow for the buyer of a new construction property. And it could be that it is a um, home, could be a townhouse, could be a condo as well. Any of those would work and they'll get up to, so the maximum amount of $20,000 to go towards the purchase of the home. And they can use that to part of their down payment. They could use it for closing costs that are associated with it. And they could actually even use it for buying down the interest rate as that $20,000. So what's the catch to this? Because of course there's gotta be a catch, right? So. The first part of this is when they purchase the property is they're going to get that up to the $20,000. But then once they have purchased and, and moved into the home, there will be then a lien against the property. And that lien will stay on the property for the term of the qualifying. So what it's saying right here is the term of the qualifying mortgage loan. So as long as they have that loan in place, there will be a lien on the property. And so when they either refinance the property or if they were to go in and actually sell the property, then what's going to happen is they'll have to pay back up to 50% of the home equity. So you're like, wow, what? Or they pay back the loan and it's going to be the lesser of the, the two. So when it comes time for them to actually sell the property or refinance, so anytime that loan goes away, What's going to happen is they'll have to repay, and the repayment is either the up to the twenty thousand, whatever it was they got for the grant on that, and then or fifty percent of the home's equity, and it's the lesser of the two of those. So anyway, just wanted to make sure that you guys were aware of that program. That it, that is something that is uh, passed and just. I believe, I don't know if the governor has signed it yet. I'm, I'm sure he, he, I can't imagine he won't. But once he does sign that, that will go into effect in July. So um, let's see. I see Lisa saying that she doesn't have any audio. So I hope I haven't just been talking to myself. Are you guys hearing me okay? We can hear you, Russ. I had one question. Is this okay, for good. anyone? Is this for anyone or just first time home buyers? Oh, thank you. I left that piece out. First time home buyers. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking that because that was one of the pieces is for first home, first time home buyers. But then, like I say, it does apply to the homes, townhouses, or commons. So cool. Any other questions? 
Okay. Next. So the next thing that I wanted to go through and talk about with you guys. So let me share my screen here again is the um, we're going to talk about the section seven of the real estate purchase contract. And then we'll talk uh, for a minute too about a few pieces from the, the contract as well. And, uh, or excuse me, part of the seller disclosures and stuff as well as we go through it. So, all right. So I just want to make sure that everyone is aware. And, and it's funny because to some extent, as Jason and I were talking about the list of what we were going to talk about as part of the um, of these uh, weekly calls, the compliance calls, you know, I got to this and I'm like, oh, I feel like we sometimes beat this to a pulp that, you know, we talk about it so much. But even just uh, yesterday and somewhat today even, I had a scenario not related to this, but something else that I feel like, oh my gosh, we talk about that all the time. And uh, it came up again. So clearly we, we do have to keep talking about some of these things that, that may seem a little basic, but also just a good refresher and reminder. So section seven of the real estate purchase contract. So no later than the seller disclosure deadline referenced in 24A, seller shall provide to the buyer the following documents in hard copy or electronic format, which are collectively referred to as seller disclosures. So again, just as a reminder that it can be in hard copy or electronic format based on the contract. And then here is the list of the things that, that we have to provide as part of the seller disclosures. And a lot of times, and, and as I say this, keep in mind, like I'm guilty of it as well. I've done this as well, where we feel like, okay, my seller disclosure deadline is in two or three or five days or whatever it is. And we make sure to get the seller property condition disclosures signed and sent over to the buyer. And we feel like, oh, okay, well, I have now met the seller disclosure deadline. But keep in mind, we've got A through L potentially here to, of items that are collectively now, what, and that's what the contract's saying, is collectively referred to as the seller disclosure. So to meet that deadline, you've got to send all of these things over. So, um, but before we jump into some of the others, I first want to talk about the seller property condition disclosures. Because two things that have come up actually in the last 24 hours that, that I just want to talk about on the seller disclosures. And the first one is um, I got a phone call last night. In fact, I had to see if it's anybody that's on here and it's not. So that's fine. But um, I got a phone call last night asking a question. Uh, and so I'm going to actually ask the question of you guys and let you tell me the answer. So I got a phone call last night from one of our agents asking, they went and listed a condo and the seller in talking about filling out the seller disclosures asked the question of the agent, the upstairs neighbors can be noisy. Do I have to disclose that on the seller disclosures? So what do you guys think? And you can either throw it in the chat box or unmute. I don't care. Either way. Just give me your thoughts. How should have I answered that question? Nobody has any thoughts. Nobody knows. It's a dumb question. What is it? People are typing. Who knows? Maybe you guys can't hear me. No one wants to answer. All right. I guess if nobody's going to answer, then we'll move on because nobody cares or nobody knows. What is it? There we go. Now I got some chats in here. All right. So Julie's saying not required unless asked. Bruce is saying disclose. Lisa says no. Um, iPhone Carolina says no. Brenda Lee says no, you do not need to disclose. So yeah, here's the thing. So I'll tell you how I answered the question and then I'll tell you what my thought was. Is initially what I did say is what you guys are saying, for most most of you are saying, is 
my my first answer to that was okay is that something that you would need to disclose and my answer was well how do you decide that the neighbors are noisy like what's the definition of the the neighbors or are the upstairs people are noisy and and so i just said i don't think you would need to disclose that so i agreed with what you guys are saying here then after i hung up i thought about it a little bit more and and really i think probably because well here's why i would say that is you know my definition of noisy neighbors and my wife's definition of a noisy neighbor are two totally different things meaning when we go and stay in a hotel my wife will tell whoever's checking us in at the hotel we have to be on the top floor versus when i would travel down to california and do trainings for our offices down there i just check into a hotel and whatever room i get's fine and and do you have some people above you occasionally that are noisy? Yeah, doesn't bother me. I just, you know, notice it and not worry about it. So what's the definition, I guess? But here's what I, here's probably the thing that I thought I would probably talk to you guys with, which by the way, I called back the person who asked me that this morning and I said, I'm changing my answer. And so here's my answer. And part of this comes from what, where my answer on this comes from is, I was with Coldwell Banker before I came over to Century 21, and we had an attorney there that sold his own home, and it was in Farmington, and for whatever reason, and I don't know why he and I got into this discussion, but, but he was selling his house, and the buyers told him they were not going to do any inspections, and so this attorney told me, I, when they told me they were not going to do any inspections, he said, I totally redid all of my seller disclosures. And he, what he told me is he said he took the seller disclosures and he checked yes on just about every single one of the items on there. Meaning, do you have knowledge of cracks in the stucco or foundation? He put yes. And so I asked him, I said, why is it that you are putting yes on all of those things and what he told me is he said anything that is disclosed on the seller disclosures basically eliminates the buyer from being able to come and sue you if they have a problem with that because a judge he said would look at that and say the seller disclosed to you x let's say cracks in a foundation and let's say those cracks ended up actually being a problem. Now he said he didn't think there were any problems with it, but, but he had still disclosed it. He said, in essence, if you went to court, a judge is gonna look at it and say, they told you there was an issue, you should have checked it out. So what I called back and said to this agent is the way probably to answer that to the client is, you know, you, know how big of a deal it is meaning like the hard part of if you say no you don't need to disclose that what if their idea of noisy neighbors was like extreme like they're standing up they're jumping up and down at two o'clock in the morning for five hours or whatever i don't know but something like that to where they could potent would maybe potentially come back saying hey why didn't you tell us this or that and and try to go to court over it versus if you have told them so even if they just put on the seller disclosures the upstairs neighbors um you hear the upstairs neighbors from time to time or something about it then uh they're not going to probably get sued over it or if they do they've got a pretty good leg to stand on to saying we did disclose so anyway i i, I think I, the answer on that is it's really kind of more i would say you you push it back to rather than saying no, you want to say to the seller, you know, look, if you disclose it, there's no chance you're going to or very unlikely chance you're going to have an issue with it versus if you don't say anything with it. But meaning and I guess here's the thing and sorry, I'm probably beating this a, a little bit, but for me, I kind of feel like if the reason they're selling the home is because of how noisy the neighbors are, then you maybe should be disclosing that. If they're selling for some other reason, and oh, by the way, the neighbors, sometimes you hear them, then maybe it's not as big of a deal. But 
if for whatever reason that was the driving factor of them moving, I would say, yes, you probably should disclose that. So anyway, how's that for the answer is both yes and no. I don't know. Anyway, so any thoughts or questions on that? I don't have a question on that in particular, but I do have a question as I was meeting with the buyer yesterday. We we're going over the buyer broker agreement um, about disclosing. They yeah. asked me, they're from out of state. And so they, and this has always been my answer. And I just want to make sure it's right. Cause we were talking about the federal fair housing laws and they're saying, well, you'll be able to tell us if a neighborhood has is safe or not, or if it's a good neighborhood. And my response is, well, no, because I don't live there. And my opinion of what a good neighborhood would be would not maybe not be your opinion, but you can, I will give you resources to be able to find out about that neighborhood. Is that how we should be answering that or? Yeah, that was perfect. Okay, because they were like, well, we, we don't live there. I'm like, yeah, but what my opinion is and what your opinion would be different um, or you know, you know, may or may not be different. But so I did answer right. I just give you resources and you can make that decision. Yep, yep. So they exactly said, well, what, right. if there's, what if there's drug people there? I'm like, well, you know, I don't know that. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. That's well, and that, the hard part is that, you know, to me, when they've said, if somebody said something like that, you know, what if there's drug people there or something like that? I, I always just say, well, that could happen in any neighborhood. Yeah. Like, and it I doesn't matter where that. you live. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Okay. That's all. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're great. Thank you. All right. So uh, the next thing then on seller disclosures that I just wanted to point out is, and um, Stephanie was on here and she still is. So that's good was um, she had asked a question this morning to me about in the seller disclosures, the public infrastructure districts. And uh, so I've done a little bit of research on that this morning and even found out a couple of things since I talked to you, Stephanie. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that. So public infrastructure districts, one of the questions on the seller disclosures is, are you aware if the property resides in or falls in a public infrastructure district? And uh, just so that you guys know what that is, is basically communities or cities, counties can create these public infrastructure districts as a way to funding projects. And so the one that I was researching this morning is the Jordan River Parkway Infrastructure District. So anybody that lives within a half of a mile, either east or west of the Jordan River, Jordan River Parkway from Utah County to Davis County, falls within this public infrastructure district where basically what it is on at least that one is about $10 a year. And that could vary based on the price of the house, but most of the homes are $10 a year is what they have to pay to help fund keeping up on the Jordan River Parkway. So just kind of as an FYI on those public infrastructure districts is if they reside within one, there are going to be some fees that they pay as part of that. And so the seller disclosure asks, is the seller aware of that? And what I found out since I talking to you, Stephanie, was I called and talked to a title company that um, and was asking some questions. And he said he has seen them show up on the PR, but not always, meaning sometimes they're lagging. So a lot of times you're going to be able to find out that the property is in that public infrastructure district because of the preliminary title report when you go look at it. But he said, not always. The other way that he recommended is, well, two other things. One is the seller should have received a notification that they are in that. So one is they should have been notified. But two is he said they could go back and look at the taxes, that their property taxes, because it would show on that as well. So Anyway, just kind of as an FYI on that, something that I learned today that uh, that I didn't know. So anyway, hopefully that's helpful um, for you guys as well. But um, back to section seven here, unless you have any questions on the infrastructure district, which I may or may not have the answer to, but I'll give it a minute and see. All right, seems like not. Okay, so next then. Uh, obviously on here, lead-based paint disclosure and acknowledgement, if the property was built prior to 1978, so just a reminder, if it was built 78 or newer, you don't need it, but 77 or older, you do need to use lead-based paint. 
disclosure and acknowledgement as part of your, your seller disclosures, which good news on that is you have to upload it when you list the property anyway. And then C, a commitment for title insurance referenced in section 6.1. So reminder on that, order your preliminary title report as soon as you list the property, as soon as you get it listed, call your title company, call North Star Title, get it ordered so that you can have that to give to them. Then next is a copy of any restrictive covenants, the CCNRs, the rules and regulations affecting the property. So on that, if the property is in an HOA, just have the seller get a copy of those. A lot of times the HOAs wanna charge you to get a copy, but they typically are not gonna charge the seller to get a copy. So the seller should be able to get a copy of that if they don't have it. Also then a copy of the most recent minutes, the budget and financial statement for the homeowners association, if, they're, if it's part of an HOA. Um, a copy of any long-term tenant lease or rental agreements affecting the property that are not going to expire before the closing. So if it expires before closing, we don't need to give it to them. But if it doesn't, we have to give a copy of that. Um, the next would be a copy of any short-term rental bookings and the schedule as, as of the seller disclosure deadline. So again, if they're doing short-term rentals that happen before the debt, that you don't need to. anything. Uh, after you would need to, uh, to make sure you give them a copy of the rental bookings. So, all right, next then would be a copy of an existing property management agreements affecting the property. So if it is a rental and they have a property manager that they're using, a copy of any of those property management agreements that would be affecting the property. And then also if it has water shares or water rights, you need to give in evidence of any of those to the buyer, uh, written notice of any claims that are conditions known to the seller relating to environmental problems or building or zoning code violations. So if you have anything that way. And then the final thing that, that we need to give is the FERPTA, which uh, again, just making sure everybody understands what that is, Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax Act. And the idea behind that is that if the buyer does not get from the seller, a tax ID number or, and when I say the buyer get it from the seller, it also can include a qualified substitute, i.e. the title company. So as long as the buyer or the title company gets the uh, tax ID number for a foreign investor, the buyer is going to be safe. But if they don't, then the buyer is going to be responsible if there are capital gains taxes that would be owed on that. So. Uh, so just kind of also, if that is a foreign person and we're, we are representing the seller, we need to make sure to get that information to, uh, to the buyer. So, and then obviously this last one is just other, if there were other things that you wanted to ask for. So does anybody have any examples of, of the time that maybe you put something on the other line in seller disclosures? I don't know if anybody's typing or not, so I'll assume not. So nobody has any examples. I All right, have Stephanie. The reserve study on there. Say that again. The reserve study. Okay, the there you way. go. The reserve good. study and the results of the reserve study. Yeah, that's actually a really good idea. I like that because um, I live in in a neighborhood that is a PUD, so we've got an HOA, and uh, and yeah, that's something that that our HOA has done a good job with, but, but yeah, it would be good to know, like what are the things they're planning for and have they set money aside for those repairs and things. So that's great. And then I also put um, any and or anything required by the lender and or buyer, just in case they want, you know, a warranty of a roof or something like that. Okay, cool. Anybody else have anything they've put on there? All right. Well, any other questions related to this or even anything else that uh, you want to talk about? Okay. Well, if not, that's all I got for you. So thanks for jumping on today. Hopefully 
some good information for you about uh, that new uh, program that'll hopefully, uh, assuming the governor will sign, be effective in July, which I think I said that, but just making sure you know. So anybody you've got doing new construction, you know, talk to them about it. Uh, it is something that has to be paid back. I don't see anything in here uh, um, about an int any interest on the, the that $20,000. So I don't believe there is anything, but it does have to be repaid. Yeah, the people fr um, from the, some girls from the state um, that go to RPAC came to our board meeting and talked about it yesterday and there's not any interest on that. Perfect. Yeah, so thanks, Jenna. That's good. To, yeah, good to know. I assume there wasn't because it didn't say anything in there on it. But just keep in mind, and they do have to pay it back when they either refinance or sell the property. So whenever that loan is paid off, the loan goes away for whatever reason, meaning refinanced or they sell the property, they pay it back and it's 50% of the equity or 20,000, whichever up to however much they got up to the 20,000 or less. So anyway. Good deal. All right. Well, hey, have a great rest of your day. If uh, Jason and I can help with anything on uh, compliance, let us know and we'll talk to you later. And go oh, just a reminder, Summit is on Monday next week. So not Tuesday, Monday. And we'll talk to you all later.